ever created in the world and with the concentration, the largest concentration of them in the world in one place, and that's in the Persian Gulf right now, where you have two carrier groups sitting right there, right in this very restricted area, a tiny, tiny sliver of water. We have so many ships in that small sliver of water that probably you could walk across the Persian Gulf on ships. And it's certainly plenty that just uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, 15 British sailors were taken captive by the Iranian naval forces. And you say, well, how in the world could that ever happen? I mean, wh that's a dangerous part of the world. I mean, all of the tensions that are going on where we have two hot-headed presidents, we have Ahmadinejad of Iran and George Bush of the United States are just slinging verbal cannons, I mean, arrows going all the time. They're talking so strongly about each other that, I mean, this is a dangerous part of the world. And surely there are rules of engagement so that there's not going to be anything um, that precipitates. I mean, they're, surely people are watching out so that there's not a flashpoint, a flame point that will cause one side or the other to react. Yet that's what we want to talk about. The possibility, the probabilities. Are there things that are being set up in that area of the world that mean that there will be a war there? That either the United States will cook up something and say the Iranians did this to us so we've got to retaliate, or the Iranians say you did something to us and this is our country and it is a right of self-defense that we take action against you, which is a legitimate right under international law. If a country is attacked, they can defend themselves. So here you have a situation two weeks ago where these uh, British sailors and these little Zodiac boats were zipping around, checking out various uh, uh, ships that were coming through this very narrow area and ships that have legitimate purposes. I mean, there are, there are all sorts of things besides just military ships in there. There are oil tankers, tons of them, that are moving oil from Iran. I mean, they're not moving it necessarily to the United States. And of course, if it doesn't come to the United States, we don't think it happens. If it's not our oil, I mean, who in the world else could be getting oil from there? Because isn't it our oil? Well, a lot of the world gets their oil from that area of the world. And there are tankers that are moving oil from Iran to China. There are, there are tankers that are moving oil from Iraq to us. There's oil moving from Bahrain. There's oil moving from Saudi Arabia. That area is just clogged. And there's also commercial traffic. Not oil tankers, but but tankers that are, or ships that are carrying all sorts of produce, merchandise, cars. And in fact, apparently these British sailors were, were going aboard. They were boarding a, sh a ship that they had heard was carrying um, cars into Iraq and somebody hadn't paid the duty or was, something was illegal about it and they were checking to see what was going on. So here they were on their little mission and all of a sudden the Iranian Navy comes up and says, you're in our waters, we're taking you. And it wasn't the first time they did it. Several years ago, there were British sailors that had been taken for being, in the, according to the Iranians at least, in the wrong place. Well, so what happened? Did World War III start there? No. There we go. There were, there were some things that were going on behind the scenes that's, that meant that the British did not react in the way that one would suspect the United States of America would have reacted. What would have happened if those had been American sailors in, that, in those Zodiac boats? Do you think we would be at war right now? Do you think there would have been something that, that would have happened? I would hope not. But from what, uh, what we, we the we, the United States, have been doing lately, I suspect that the, the response would have been ratcheted up a whole lot more. Uh, right now, we, as the invader and occupier of, a, of Iraq, 
uh, even though we say we've given the sovereignty back to Iraq, but we still do go into uh, Iranian consulates and take out people, uh, diplomatic, diplomatic institutions that supposedly are sovereign territory of the country they represent, even though it's in a different, different country, but uh, by diplomatic laws and courtesies, you're not supposed to go in breaking into somebody else's consulate, even if it is to go get somebody that you think may be supplying arms to somebody else. Because if that is true, how about the military attaches that are sitting in the U.S. Embassy in the Green Zone? I mean, they are doing the, exactly the same thing. Of course, in our views, that's our right. I mean, we're there to help. We, were, we invaded and occupied. It is our land. And even though half the Iraqis, at least, or more, say you ought to be out of here, because our soldiers are there, we get a free pass on this. But to a lot of the countries of the world, America is, is not, should not be given a free pass. But what we did was take five, five Iranians, who the Iranians say are diplomats, and we say are arms agents. And did we give them back? The, the British were held for, what, two weeks? The British sailors were held by the Iranians for two weeks. How long have we held the five Iranian diplomats? Yeah, we've still got them. They are part of 250 foreigners that the United States of America are holding in Iraq right now. And there seems to be a little bit of a discussion within the administration on what to do with them. Uh, one, one article says that Condoleezza Rice, had, as Secretary of State, has said, it's in the best interest of the United States that we return those, those five diplomats. She was overruled. So we, the United States, are still holding those five diplomats. How many other people are being held in Iraq right now? 17,000 people are detained in Iraq. 17,000, those would be Iraqis. Our peace surge, no, not, that's what we call it. It's the war surge. That, you know, the thing that happened after Christmas where we are putting in another 21,500 people to calm the war down in, in Iraq. How many of those people were for purely detention purposes? Anybody know? The newspapers say that 2,500 more military policemen have been requested to go to Iraq because it is the intent of the United States during this surge to detain more and more Iraqis. Right now, we already have 17,000 of them. And we did such a good job on prison, prison care for Abu Ghraib and other things. I would say that, that probably that part of the surge is not going to be working any better than it had before. So the detention of people, 250 foreigners detained in Iraq, including five, five Iraqis, uh, five Iranians. That's something we need to always be keeping in mind. Who do we have detained and why are they being detained? Today in the, in the newspaper, oh, there's just so much stuff. I've, I've been kind of out of touch. I was up at Trap Rock uh, Peace Center up in Western Massachusetts attending a social forum. So I didn't really get to check every single day everything that was happening. So this morning before I left, I quickly, you know, kind of downloaded a, a couple of articles. And uh, uh, one of them was, uh, a U.S. general, uh, the deputy operations commander of CENTCOM, you know, because there is, are, is the U.S. planning to attack Iraq? We've had various statements coming out of the administration. Back in last fall, the statements were, all options are on the table for Iran. We're not taking any options off, to include the nuclear option. That was one of the questions. Well, this, the, the deputy operations uh, uh, chief for S the Central Command uh, has just said that uh, uh, the U.S. has no plans to attack Iraq. Uh, this is the latest U.S. rejection of military action. It says we do have plans, but we aren't planning on implementing them. It does say that tensions have risen over Washington's accusations that Ter Tehran is providing deadly weapons and training to militants attacking U.S. forces in Iraq, a claim Iran denies. President Bush has said that the U.S. military would aggressively pursue Iranian agents who stir up trouble in Iraq. So, so now they've got, to, they've got to identify, you know, which are these Iranian agents? 
Well, this general says, well, there's a little bit of backtracking on what the administration says versus what the military says, the professional military. Our military is saying the presence of certain weapons, certain technology, certain tactics and techniques point us to elements of the Iranian military, but I would be remiss if I then connected dots any greater than that. He says he believes the military, that military action against Iran would not be the best course of action, uh, that you, the Admiral Bill Fallon, who was the commander of U.S. forces first in the Pacific, out where I live in, in Hawaii, now the new commander of Central Command, says he does not view military action with Iran as desired military activity right now. The last resort of conflict is war. We should use diplomacy before war. Well, I agree with that. Our, I think our military probably wishes there had been a heck of a lot more diplomacy before the decision to go into Iraq was made. And I think public statements like this are very, very important because our military is signaling to us, the people, the people of the country, that they need some help. They need some help to stave off a political decision that is not, not based on national security, is not based on military, t uh, military necessity, but is, just ma is based on political aspirations to use military force. These are important statements and do use them, do, do talk about them, do come to Washington with us because really what I'm interpreting this is that our military is saying, if you all, if you the people of America don't want the U.S. military to be going into Iraq, into Iran, and by going into it may not be an invasion because right now our military is probably incapable of doing large scale ground operations in Iraq. Most of the military leaders are saying that the military is, I wouldn't say broken, but it is incapable of mounting further large-scale operations. We have a military that is totally dependent on the Reserve and National Guard forces, whose equipment has been pretty well used up in Iraq. We have men and women that are pretty well fed up with having to go back to Iraq or Afghanistan for not just one time, two times, and many of them like Marines that go back that can go for in for seven months and then they have a, a short time back. Many of them have been three and four times. Yeah, they're volunteers. That's what you know, everybody tells them, suck it up, you volunteered. Well, they didn't volunteer for this. 